Alan, uh, for reading us. I, I love Acts 5. Um, and, you know, it's so funny, as, as Alan was reading it, I was, I was just being so reminded of so many of the themes uh, through the book of Hebrews that we have talked about that I just see so evident there in, in Acts chapter 5. And, I, and again, I love this, I love this phrase uh, that Camille says to them and when he says that uh, if, this, if, for if this plan or undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Thanks be to God today we stand and we are reminded again that the plan that Peter and John talked about was not of man. And it has stood the test of time. And we are here today because of the truth of that gospel. And we talked this morning about the fact of, um, in, in Psalm 40, where just being reminded of the number of times that David says that we must tell of the great deliverance. We must not restrain our lips, right? That, you know, there's, there's and we talked about this a little bit this morning, is the fact that, yes, our lives need to reflect the gospel, but we also need to be reminded that God has given us a mouth that we must use to proclaim the excellency of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And, and so again, uh, again, that consistent theme too, again, where the writer of Hebrews talked, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, about even um, considering uh, go, to, to going out to Christ and to bearing the reproach of Christ. And that's what the, that's what the, uh, the apostles were saying here, that they, were cons- that they considered themselves worthy to be dishonored for the name of Christ. And, and again, that just that continued challenge to us as we live in this day and age that is growing more and more hostile to the, to the things and to the ways of the Lord, that are we, do we consider it worthy? Would, do, do we consider it an honor to be dishonored for the sake of Christ as we obey God rather than man? Well, this morning, with that lead in, and Tim and Janet, just thank you for the songs that you have chosen as well, as Alan said. Um, Man, those final two songs, I really, really, as I was sitting there, and there there was tears coming to my eyes as we were singing, uh, especially that last song. Um, I really do pray that those are not just songs that we sing with our mouths, but those are truly, is that truly the cry of our lips, that, that God would have his way, that his will would be done in our lives? And, and ultimately, again, that he would be glorified in our lives, in our lives, in our home, and in our church. And what, a, what a, again, what an amazing segue into this message this morning as we've gone through, as we look at Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, and so if you've got your Bibles with you, I want to invite you for the final time. Uh, to turn to the book of Hebrews. Um, and and as, we, as we bring this series, as far as my messages go, to a close. Now next Sunday, Richard Giesbrecht's going to be here, and he's going to share one more message from the book of Hebrews on Hebrews chapter 12 that he was supposed to share in June, but wasn't able, able to, but we're going to bring him in, let him share what God's laid upon his heart. But for the last time for me, and being able to invite you to Hebrews chapter 13. And it's hard to believe that a sermon series that we started... On September 26, 2021 is coming to completion. And I trust and pray it's been encouraging, it's been a challenging, and it's been convicting. And it's been for the glory of God. As we come to the end of Hebrews 13, what I find so interesting is, is what I find at the end of most of the books of, uh, of, the, of the New Testament. And, and, and as we get to the end of those books, as we get to the letters, especially the letters of Paul, and, and Don asked me this, she's like, are you excited to get on to the next series? And that, that has the tendency to be me as I'm preparing for my next series. I'm like, man, I just want to get there. And, and we fail to really take in the ending of each of these letters and the ending of this book. And, and so I don't, want to do, I, want, I don't want us to do that this morning because I think back to when Don and I were dating, you know, and she would send me an email or she would send me a letter. You know, I would pour over and I would take, and I would take a good look at every word from the first hello to the, to the last goodbye that she would say in her email. And really that's my heartbeat as we consider this final prayer from the book of Hebrews. You know, I find it so interesting because as we think back to last Sunday and to, uh, to all that we went through, we were, we were reminded last Sunday in verses 18 to 19, the writer of Hebrews really says to the, to the Jewish people, he, as he talks about this, this importance of leadership, of godly leadership, he says to them, he says, would you pray for us? Would you pray for us? Look at verse 18. He says, would you pray for us? That we would, that for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring, desiring to act honorably in all things. 
And that really does become his cry. He's saying, as I, as I outline this godly leaders, he's like, I, I, want you, I need your prayers. We need your prayers for us as leaders. But then as he gets to verse 20, the writer then shifts gears and he says, but here's my prayer for you. Here's my prayer for you. And this prayer is chock full. These two verses that we really want to zone in on today. These two verses are chock full of rich and beautiful and powerful theology. And as we close this book, we are going to see a prayer that reminds the Jewish people of themes that we have talked about through this entire book. And the overarching theme of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is greater. And the reminder that a return to Judaism will not bring glory to God. But rather it is God working in and through them, through Jesus Christ, to his honor and to his glory forever and ever. And so we want to read the final prayer it's in, in its entirety, and then we want to break it down. And I want to give us really five reminders, five reminders in this prayer that we have seen throughout this entire book of what God longs for us to hear. And so why don't you stand with me as we read this prayer of, of um, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21, and then we want to break it down. We want to pray, and then we want to break it down. So Hebrews chapter 13, verse, 30, verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Why don't we pray? As we begin, Father, we thank you for the fact this morning again that the message of Peter and John in Acts 5 was not a message of men, a message that would fail, but it is a message that has stood and continues to stand throughout the course of time. Father, it is a message that we need to stand for in this day and age that we live in, in this world that we live in that is becoming more and more hostile to the truths of who you are, to the truths of your word, to the truths of your gospel. And Father, I pray as, as, as they prayed and we continue to pray, God, would you give us the boldness to stand in the face of opposition, counting it an honor to be dishonored for your name. And Father, I pray as we face these days, as we face these trials, Lord, again, being reminded that the tested genuineness of our faith, which is more precious than gold, and will bring, about, and will bring to the glory and, and honor of you, I pray, Father, that that is what we long for. Lord, I pray that those two songs that we have sung, all the songs that we've sung, but especially those last two, I pray that they would truly be the cry of our hearts, that, we, that you would have your way in us, O oh Lord. And that, Lord, in our lives and in our homes and in our church, that you would be glorified. But, Father, as we go into these final words of this book that you have given to the Jewish people, but also to us that have been written down for our instruction, for our encouragement, for our example... Lord, I thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you for the reminders in this, in this benediction of the truth of who you are and of what you've done. And so God, I ask and pray this morning that you would give us ears and hearts that are ready to hear from you. And that you would help me to speak no more and no less than what it is that you have for us. So Lord, we love you. And we thank you again for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So you can have a seat, and as you are, as you do, as we, are, as we consider this benediction, we want to be reminded of five, five truths as we close the book of Hebrews. And here's reminder number one. Reminder number one is that God is the God of peace. Is God is the God of peace. 
As the writer is coming, is committing these people, as he prays for these people, and he commits them to the Lord, as he commits them to the, these people that he dearly loves, these people that he has spent the time reminding them that Jesus is greater, that Jesus is sufficient, that Jesus is necessary for faith, because they were contemplating abandoning the faith and returning to Judaism. As we think, as we, as, as we consider what the writer, that the writer is committing these people that he loves so dearly and is praying that they would have endurance to run the race that is set before him, before them. He reminds them, he begins by reminding them who he's committing them to. Look at the first words of this benediction. The first five words of this benediction. Now may the God of peace. This is not the first time in a benediction that God is referred to as the God of peace. And to be honest, as I, as I thought about this this week and as I was reflecting on that title, I was like, why the God of peace? You know, why does he pray that prayer? May the God of peace. Why not almighty God? Why not the God of victory? Why not the God of power? But he says, now may the God of peace. And it's interesting because, and as I considered that thought, Raymond Brown says in his commentary on the book of Hebrews, he says these words. He says, peace in biblical thought is something more than just serenity. Because that's what I think of when I think of peace. It denotes the quality of salvation God is able to give his people. And as I reflected on that phrase, and as uh, that phrase began to make sense to me, as I began to go through some of the other benedictions that, that uses this phrase, the God of peace. Look at some of them on the screen. Philippians chapter 4 verse 9 says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 4, verse 23 and 24 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And then we get to Romans 16, 9, 16 20, which was one of my favorite uses of it, and is also one that makes me think of Bible camps. Because of the song where Paul writes, the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, I really like this one because it's just of, the, the, just of that picture of God crushing Satan under our feet. But then I was also reminded of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. As Jesus came to the earth, fully God, fully man, and he came, as Isaiah reminds us, that for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Here it is, the Prince of Peace. And so again, as we see throughout these verses, as the writer is reminding, as the writer of Hebrews is now then reminding the Jewish people of peace, and again, this comes from this Greek word, is, is, is identical to the Hebrew word shalom, he reminds them again that God's peace is more than just serenity. God's peace is the quality of salvation that through Jesus Christ brings us his presence. Brings us his sanctification. Where we again, where God deals with the sin in our lives and causes us to become more and more like Christ. And the God of peace brings victory by crushing Satan under our feet. This is the God we serve. This is the God who, again, the writer of Hebrews is committing these Jewish lives to. And as we consider the reminders of what the God of peace has done, is doing, and will do, our confidence cannot simply be in just what God does, but rather in who God is. I was reminded again of that this morning as we talked, and, and I prayed this in our prayer, again, that the fact that our trust, and this is, what the, this is what David says, this is also what Jeremiah says, that our trust cannot just be in the Lord, but our trust must be the Lord. 
And so I've been struck by this point so much as I was studying this week because the reality is, is that Scripture, again, doesn't just remind us of what God does. Scripture reveals to us who God is. And if we don't know who God is, then how can I trust what God does? And so the writer of Hebrews really ends this letter by once again reminding the people I am committing you, this is my prayer for you, that the God of peace would accomplish these things in your life. And so again, the reminder number one, again, is of who God is, that God is the God of peace. But here's the second reminder for us this morning. The second reminder is not only who God is, but also, again, jumping into what God does. And we see that the God of peace, understanding who he is, the God of peace raised Jesus from the dead. And this was the message that Alan read for us in Acts chapter 5. This was the message that Peter and John proclaimed to the religious leaders. That look Again, jump back to Acts chapter 5 with me for a second, because this struck me as Alan was reading it to us. In Acts chapter 5, as soon as we get there, because this uh, Acts chapter 5, hopefully you're turning there because it's not going to be on the screen. Um, look at Acts chapter 5, verse 30. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. So right after they said, but with Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Verse 30, the God of our father, uh, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel in the forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to us, to those who obey him. So once again, again, as, as, Peter, as Peter and the apostles reminded the, the religious leaders back then, as the writer of Hebrews is reminding us here in Hebrews chapter 13, that the God of peace raised Jesus from the dead. And again, as, as the writer brings us, back to the, brings us to this point, he brings us back to the foundation of our faith. That we do not serve a Savior who is dead. We, save a, we serve a Savior who died and is risen again. As we think back to the understanding that the God of peace, of the, of the God of peace and how the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet, the reason why Paul can say that to the church at Rome is because ultimately God crushed Satan under Christ's feet. That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. You see, he crushed Satan under his feet because he sent Jesus Christ to come into this world to live a perfect life, to take your sin, to take my sin upon his shoulders, to bear the wrath of God and the judgment of God that you and I deserved. Then he died, but notice this, notice this, but he rose again. And that's the hope that we have. That's why 1 Peter can remind us again that we were born again to a living hope. Paul makes it very clear for us that our hope is not just in the death of Jesus, but rather in the resurrection of Jesus. That's why he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, he says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. We need to be constantly reminded, right? And again, I, I just love how these passages tie so closely together. Because, Al, I mean, Alan and I didn't talk about what passage he was going to read this morning. But I love how they talk, again, as, as was instructed to these religious leaders. Like, if this is a man, it's going to fail. If Jesus, if Jesus remained dead, then he's like every other religious leader. But he's not. He is risen, just as he said. And so as the writer is committing these Jewish people to the Lord, he is committing them to the one who has overcome the grave. He's committing them to the one who has overcome the power of sin and death. He is committing them to the one who has destroyed the work of the evil one. Peter makes that very clear in his message on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, when Peter says, This Jesus delivered up by the, according to the definitive plan and the foreknowledge of God, you crucified, and see, see the consistency in their messages? You killed you crucified and killed by the hand of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. I shared with you before that multiple, multiple times that this phrase, uh, because it was not possible, 
I love so much, I stand in awe of, and it reminds me of the hope that I have because if the pangs of death cannot be, if, if, if cannot stop God from raising Jesus Christ from the dead, then what is there that God cannot do, including raising me from spiritual death? You see, the God of peace has overcome the greatest of enemies by, raise, by raising Jesus Christ from the dead and giving us hope. Be reminded this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Again, we encur- I encourage you, go home, read this chapter again this afternoon. He says there in verse 17 to 20, And if Christ had not been raised... As he debates the aspect of the fact that people were teaching that there was no resurrection, he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has raised from the dead, been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so what the writer, the writer is describing to us how awesome and great this God of peace is. And he brings us back, as Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15, to the reminder that if Christ is dead, if Christ is, is not raised, then we have no hope. But I love verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. But I also want us to notice, look, in, look, at the end, look at the middle of verse 20 of our benediction today. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. Now notice this next phrase, the great shepherd of the sheep. Now this always brings me back to that, that reminder of those great animals, right? Those, those sheep who are as great as an animal as they are, they are not the brightest of all animals. And they're constantly used as an illustration of us. And they continually and they continually remind me of their need by the shepherd to restore them, to bring them back, to protect them, to lead them, to guide them, to be willing to sacrifice for them. And again, they are a great illustration of you and I. I thought about that this week as I walked past. If you walked past my office door, it was a number of years ago, we handed out kid sheets, and I have a whole bunch of kid sheets that are colored. With, uh, uh, and, and a lot of them, or one of them in particular, has sheep all over them. And I was reminded of that this week as I think about this great shepherd of the sheep. You see, no greater shepherd has there been than the one who sacrificed himself but rose from the dead. Look at what he says in John chapter 10, verse 14 to 16 on the screen for you. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Look at the truth in that verse. Look at the truth in these declarations that Jesus is making. Let me just point out a couple of them to you. First of all, the fact that Jesus knows who is who is who is His. Right? He says there, he says, I know my own and my own know me. Look at how he points to even the depth of the relationship. He says, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, that's how well I know my sheep. But he says also there too, he says, my sheep also know me. And then he says, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Do you see the richness of theology, the richness of truths in these, ver- in these words? But then notice he says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And I thank God for the fact, because again, that's us as Gentiles. And he's still bringing people into this fold. He says, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. But notice this last phrase. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. I want you to think about that for a second. Muhammad doesn't have a flock. Buddha doesn't have a flock. Joseph Smith doesn't have a flock. These religious leaders don't have flocks. There is one flock and one shepherd. And anyone who is not in that flock, belonging to that shepherd, will be separated from God for all of eternity in the place called hell. You see, again, we are reminded in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, that says, you were straying like sheep, but now, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseers of your souls. And so maybe today, even as you sit here, in this building, you're sitting in this building, but maybe this morning you're straying like sheep. Here's the call. Return to your shepherd. Return to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. 
The writer, of, again, Peter's saying, God's call to us today is return to the shepherd who I have raised from the dead. Because it's only through him, that understand this this morning, it is only through him that we will experience the ultimate peace with God. And that leads us to reminder number three. So reminder number three is that the God of peace has established the eternal covenant. So we've got the, the God of peace who's raised Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, and then notice the middle of verse, uh, notice the end of verse 20. Look at it there. He says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. Again, this has been a major theme throughout the book, throughout the, especially the later half of the book of Hebrews. As God is, the God of peace is established through the eternal covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. The old covenant, the one that was established with Moses and the law has been set aside because Hebrews chapter 7 verse 18 and 19 reminds us of these words when he says, for on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, and this is what we cling to this morning, on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. We have talked about so much through this series that the old covenant has always been about pointing us to the new covenant because the old was limited. The old was temporary. But God establishes through what? Through the blood of Jesus Christ a covenant, a new covenant that is powerful, a new covenant that is effective, the new covenant that is sufficient, and the new covenant that is eternal. Why? Because it's not resting in the work of men, but rather resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. You see, the new covenant is established as eternal. That's what he says, by the blood of the eternal covenant. It's established as eternal. Why? Because the one who guarantees the covenant is eternal and greater. Look again at a couple of verses here on the screen. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, where the writer says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have to come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blo the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Again, last week we talked about the fact that godly leaders, as was evidenced by Peter and the apostles in Acts 5, continue to preach Christ crucified. And how this message needs to remain the centrality of the message because Christ is the only one who could have gone into the holy places. Not the ones made with human hands, but he's the only one who could have gone into heaven itself. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. And notice again this phrase, thus securing that eternal redemption for us. Again, Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to flip there, it's on the screen, but I want you to flip there. Just go back a couple pages in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 to 17. There the writer says to us again, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their minds, quoting again Jeremiah 31. And then he adds, I will remember their sins no more. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. The God of peace has promised He's delivered, he's promised, he's established, and he has delivered the eternal covenant through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and through it perfecting those who have been set apart to this covenant. And so this morning what the writer of Hebrews is doing is, friends, be reminded of the quality of salvation that God has brought. 
that, that the, the quality of salvation that God has established that will not end, that is guaranteed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who dwells in us until we take possession of it at the day of Jesus Christ. The God of peace has given us the ultimate covenant through the ultimate guarantor. And so the, as the theme has been through the book of Hebrews, stop running to things that don't deliver, but come to the one who has. So that brings us to point number four, reminder number four. And this really does become the prayer, right? All this has been the lead up to this, to this verse, to verse four, right? Because this really is his prayer. Understanding what God has done, now we see what God is doing. And here's verse four, is that the, the reminder number four is that the peace, the God of peace equips us to please him. He equips us to please him. Again, look at, look as, uh, look at the fact that through this as we see that we understand who God is through the God of peace. He's brought from the dead the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. He's established the eternal covenant in the one is now, as we think about all those things, the writer of Hebrews says, be reminded, he's the one working in you to live a life pleasing to the Lord. You know, as we've said over the last couple of weeks, I am so thankful for the fact that God has not called us to something that we have to do all by ourselves. But rather, he reminds us of the hope that we have in Christ. And he reminds us again that he has given us the strength, the power, and the capability to do it, but it's not because of ours. Look at verse 21. This is what he says there. Verse 21, he says, equipped you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. I love this word equip because the word equip literally means to make adequate, to produce, to arrange, to create, to furnish completely. In other words, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, if you are expecting to please God apart from Christ, you're never going to be able to do it. You're never going to be able to live that life pleasing to him. And this is what Paul reminds the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, when he says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Again, notice this phrase. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, God doesn't just give us, it's interesting, God doesn't just give us the capability to please him, but God gives us the desire to please him. As God works in our lives, God transforms our will and our desire to please him in the first place. Again, understand, it's not just that God is working out his will in our lives, but he needs to equip us with the desire to serve him in the first place because we are so selfish in our desires and our, and our, and our hearts. Again, we see that in Jeremiah 17, 9. Where Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful and above, above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? But as we think about a verse that we're going to look at in great detail as we walk through Psalm 51 in the month of August, that's why David cries out in Psalm 51 verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Create in me a clean heart. Why? Why does he cry out that to God? Because God's the only one who can. God's the only one who can change our hearts. But notice what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that his, he says, Now may the God of peace, who's brought from the dead the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, who's established the eternal covenant, he says, equip you with everything good. What's the everything good? To equip you with salvation through Christ, through his justification, through his redemption, through, his, uh, through, his faith, through faith in Christ. He's equipped us with the power of the Holy Spirit through sanctification, through conviction, through leading, through guiding, through teaching, through rebuking, through growing fruit in us. And he's equipped us with all of this in order to do what? In order to do his will. In order to live a life pleasing to him. God has, understand this morning, trust and believe and rest in this, that God has equipped us with everything good in order to honor him. Why? Because Ephesians 2.10 reminds us that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What I love about this phrase, this phrase workmanship, and I've, I've heard this 
verse since I was like a little boy, right? This word workmanship literally means God's production. God, I lo- and I, there was something about that that I love. God's production. Not created in, because of who we are or because of the good things that we've done or because we go to church or read our Bibles, but, as God, but we, as God's production, who were created by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You see, that's why the writer of Hebrews, look at the, towards the end of verse 21 there, and circle this phrase, underline this phrase, highlight this phrase in your Bible, through Christ. Through Christ. Understand today, in Christ, we were created for the glory and the praise of God. And as, as the God of peace equips us with everything good, the writer of Hebrews is saying, walk in those works. Paul's saying, walk in those works that will bring glory to him. Now, one more thing that I found interesting about this word equip as I was studying it was the word equip, the Greek word equip, actually comes from the word that literally, with the idea, that literally carries with the, the idea of restoring, of repairing, of, of mending. In fact, one commentator said that there was, uh, that it is the same word that is used to describe the work of dis- the disciples when they were mending their nets. And there was something about that that was just so beautiful to me as I read that definition because it reminded me, and I was thinking about this even throughout this week, it was reminding me that there's so many times that I see the failures, that I see the mistakes, that I see the sin in my life, and I think to myself, man, God can't use me. God can't work in me because look at all of this. And yet we're reminded again that just because we see those failures, just because we see those mistakes, just because we see the sin, doesn't mean that God can never choose to use us. Too many times, Satan is constantly reminding us of our shortcomings. Satan is constantly reminding us of our weaknesses. And yet God, and yet this word equip shows us that God take, can take our mistakes and our failures and our sin, mend them, redeem them with everything good to do his will and to bring him glory. Now, as I say that, though, I want us to understand this. That we must be bringing those mistakes, those failures, that sin to the Lord. We cannot, and and I, I cannot emphasize this enough, we cannot expect to live a life pleasing to the Lord and be constantly walking in unrepentant habitual sin. Because we need to be reminded this morning that the God of peace is also the God of holiness. And God is just, who cannot stand in the presence of sin. But what I believe the writer of Hebrews is reminding us of this morning is, don't let your failures stop you from believing that God can use you. And praying that God would use you. Let me give you two examples of that. And they're famous examples. But I think about the first one, and the first one is Peter. And Peter would have understood this, this idea of mending and restoring But Peter is the one who was taken from denying Christ three times in the courtyard on the night of Christ's death to being restored in John chapter 21 as Jesus and Peter stand on the the shore and, and, and Jesus continually says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I do, Lord. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Love my sheep. He restores them three times And then he takes him from restoring him in John 21, then then to moving him to Acts 2, where he fills Peter and the rest of the apostles, the rest of the disciples with the power of the Holy Spirit. And Peter Peter preaches this message where over 3,000 souls were added on the day of Pentecost. And then, of course, the other one is Paul. Paul, the one who persecuted Christians until God met him on the road to Damascus and he changed his life equipping him to do the work of taking the gospel to the Gentile people and becoming the majority writer of the, of the New Testament. Again, all this to say, don't let your failures stop, stop you from being fully surrendered to what God wants to do in and through you that will ultimately bring him glory. And so maybe today, as we think about this, as we think about this benediction, maybe today you're frightened because you don't know where this might take you. And I don't know where this might take me or us. Maybe today God is calling you into a conversation with a person that you don't know how to share the gospel with. Remember, God equips you. 
Maybe it's you're being asked to walk with someone through a difficult situation and you don't know how to do it. Remember, God equips you. Maybe you're being asked to forgive someone who has hurt you deeply. Remember, God equips you. Maybe it's you're being called into a new situation that you're not sure you want to go to. Remember, God equips you. The question that we have as we think on these words is, do we, trust that the, do we trust that the God of peace who raised Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep from the dead, and, and, and the, established the eternal covenant, do we trust that he's going to equip us with everything good to do his will, working in you, not just in someone else, but working in you to do that which is pleasing in his sight? Do we trust that? Do we hold on to that? As it brings us to reminder number five. And here's reminder number five. Reminder number five is this, is that the God of peace deserves the glory. The God of peace deserves the glory. With all this in mind, the writer of Hebrews closes his benediction by reminding us that this, is, this all is not for our glory, it's for his. You see, look at the end. He says, to whom be glory forever and ever. You see, again, we were created for this. We were created for the glory and the praise of God. Look at ver- some of the verses on the screen for us. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Isaiah 60, verse 20 says, Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the works of my hands. Why? That I might be glorified. Why? Because Romans eleven thirty six 36 reminds us of these words, that for we're from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. As we consider the message of the book of Hebrews, that Jesus is greater than the angels, than Moses, than Joshua, than the priests, and the Old Testament sacrificial system, the old covenant, we come back to this place. It's all about the glory of God. Someone Someone sent me a text recently, and they shared with me a quote by Paul Washer that really struck me as I was preparing for Hebrews 13. And the quote said this, Are you doing it for God or for you in God's name? And as I kept thinking, as I kept thinking about that quote, all I kept thinking was, motives matter. Do I desire that my life would be used for the glory of God? Am I praying, God, would you equip me? Would you equip those around me? Would you equip this church with, you know, as you've equipped us with everything good so that I, so that we would be able to fulfill your will, fully pleasing to you, to, for your praise and for your glory? Or am I still desiring the glory goes to myself? No matter what the situation we find ourselves in, understand that, no matter what the situation we find ourselves in, is an opportunity to bring glory to God. In one, one of the most powerful praise, prayers, I believe, and this is on my wall in my office, and it struck me again, one of the most powerful prayers in Scripture, here's what Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 27, as he faces the cross. He says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Notice this, Father, save me from this hour, because if I'm honest, that's exactly what, that's, that's, that's the times, that's exactly what I'm praying. Father, save me from this, save me from this hour, save me from this suffering, save me from this trial. But notice what Jesus says. He says, but for this purpose, I've come to this hour. And here's what he says in verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Father, glorify your name. The writer of Hebrews has reminded us through this book that God deserves the praise. God deserves the glory. God will receive the glory for all of eternity. But does that start now? So again, as we've talked about each of these weeks, as we've gone through Hebrews 13, let me ask us again. Is worship an activity we participate in or a life that we live. God has equipped us with everything good to live a life pleasing to him for his glory. Are we willing to walk in it? And so as we close, as we close this time, as we close this book, the writer gives a final few final greetings in verses 20, 23 to 24, or 22 to 24, encouraging the people with the release of Timothy and the call to greet each other. But he says to them, he says, I appeal, to bro- I appeal to you brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. 
And that's my, that's my close as we close the book of Hebrews. I pray that we would remember his exhortation. That Jesus is greater. And that if we have not surrendered our lives to him, that today would, we would not harden our hearts towards him because today is the day of salvation. But if we have, then I pray that today as we seek to live our lives pleasing to the Lord, we would remember today that knowing the God of peace who brought again, who brought from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, who's established the eternal covenant through his blood, has equipped us, he has equipped us with everything good to do that which is pleasing in his sight. May we walk in the strength and the power and the might of our God for his honor and for his glory, we pray. So why don't we close this time in prayer? And so Father, thank you for this incredible book that we have had the privilege of walking through. Thank you for the reminder, again, that Jesus is greater than anything else. That Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is necessary. And it's through him that we are drawn near to you. Father, I pray in these days that we are living in, that we would lay aside the weights and the sin which clings so closely, and that we would run this race with endurance, looking to Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. And so, Father, we pray all of this in his name we ask, and for your glory we pray. Amen.